in the cloud. Okay. Sorry, recording has started. Thank you. Mm, yeah. Hi everyone, welcome to the Jenkins Governance Board meeting. Today is August 26, and uh, we will have a discussion of several topics. So we have uh, six contributors on the call. Um, and yeah, uh, based on our agenda, we will talk about some news. Then we have a GitHub for the relationship proposal from Daniel, a Jira upgrade discussion, also preparation to uh, the next board and officer elections, uh, a sync up on the incoming community events, a roadmap review, which we tend to relate to this meeting to follow the JEP 14 process. But again, it depends on how much time we have. And Kubernetes creative governance discussion, uh, okay, if we get time, uh, let's discuss that. And yeah, uh, this, that's all topics we have on the list. So does anybody have any news to share? This was brought up in this week's infra meeting, but I think we can mention it here as well. Um, we are now um, serving our um, Jenkins core and plugin downloads via HTTPS. Um, it was not a big of a problem as this sounds because Jenkins downloads were verified by Jenkins, and it has actually fairly elaborate structure to ensure the, the download integrity. But uh, now even that, is, even problems like uh, corporate proxies rejecting any outgoing HTTP URLs and stuff like that are no longer a problem. So basically, it's modernizing community infrastructure, right? So the storage uh, needs to be planned. We solved both Infra 160 from 2010, as well as Infra 266, which is not a lot newer. Okay, so yeah, there are all the issues, and then one which is referenced from the roadmap. Excellent. Because uh, yeah. Yeah, when we go discussing the infrastructure roadmap, uh, we took quite an abstract uh, um, topic because yeah, it uh, includes not on the resolvent mirror bits, but yeah, big thanks for doing that. And uh, Daniel, if you could uh, update this epic and could take it today, it would be awesome. Uh, but yeah, I guess our next step would, here would be to actually have uh, more mirrors because before we were blocked um, due to a lack of HTTPS on mirrors. Now we can actually reestablish the mirror infrastructure. Additionally, we will also s probably solve the problem mm -hmm. of downloads not being available for the first hour or so after a plugin is released. So that caused some problems, especially with new Jenkins installations whenever uh, new releases were released of popular plugins. Um, right now, this costs some more money. Uh, Tim will know the details there. Um, but for now, it is resolved until the bill comes due, I guess. And and I am delighted to have proven what Daniel described. I downloaded a plugin that had been released 51 minutes prior and no issue. Thanks, Daniel. Marvelous result. Yeah, uh, great. And yeah, thanks a lot uh, to Daniel, to Tim uh, for working on that. It's pure infrastructure issue, but it should help uh, our users a lot. And yeah, combined with package Jenkins IO stabilizations on fast DVD, uh, hopefully downloads will be much more stable. Okay, other news is yeah, we had a security release. So it was uh, a few days after the previous meeting. Is any is notable to mention there, Daniel? Um, nothing really notable there. Um... What might be more notable is the one we had published uh, just five days later. Mm -hmm. um, the problem there was that um, the Jetty integrated servlet uh, server um, had a vulnerability and we just updated it as usual um, in the Jenkins weeklies, but not in LTS. 
And when we finally got around to investigating it in more detail, we identified that uh, the vulnerability is fairly easy to ex uh, exploit in Jenkins. So we made the decision to publish an LTS-only security update um, that is unscheduled um, and pushed it out basically as, as quickly as we manage, as, as quickly as possible. Um, the weekly releases were not affected. Uh, as I said, we did a routine update there. Um, it was only LTS. Uh, I think it went uh, overall fairly well. Um, since we went from from identifying the problem to the release in two two days, two two weekdays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot to that. And another issue change which we integrated is also Alpine Images update, which was was a kind of long cover view. But yeah, thanks to Alex, Mark, and other contributors uh, for handling that. Because now our Alpine images officially run on Adopt OpenGDK with the recent versions of uh, Alpine Linux. So it uh, should be much more convenient for users. I guess our next steps to actually update uh, all other images to Adopt OpenGDK. Yeah, okay. I think I have a PR for that uh, already, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I'll have to look. Yeah, uh, there is a pull request. Mm, yeah, you use uh, packaging structure changes, etc. Okay, and another thing which was mentioning right now we have a, I guess, a branch uh, for backporting for the next LCS baseline, right? Uh, yeah, this, I guess, this, uh, right? So the branch is ready. Uh, we are slightly behind uh, the release candidate, um, but yeah, I guess we could uh, get it out uh, tomorrow. So, and then we will be on track, right? So, but yeah, the branch itself uh, should be ready. Uh, there are some discussions about, for example, .NET framework patches, etc. But uh, uh, I think that uh, overall it should be stable enough in the current state. Okay. So, any other news uh, to discuss? I guess no, then let's uh, go to GitHub for relationship. Daniel? Yes, I proposed uh, a few days ago, a few weeks ago, um, on the dev list that we uh, clean up the fork relationships of repositories in the Jenkins CI GitHub organization. Um, we have a lot of forks in the organization because that is how the hosting process works. Um, someone creates a repository in their own account and to host it in the Jenkins project, we create a fork using the GitHub API. Um, the problem is that the expectation is actually that the repository in the Jenkins CI organization is the canonical repository where all the work and collaboration happens and it's supposed to be uh, specified in the POM and so on and so forth. Um, and so my proposal is to clean this up. Um, I've uh, confirmed with GitHub support that uh, if both the uh, Jenkins CI organization owners and the owner of the uh, upstream repository agree, the fork relationship can be inverted. Um, and we can alternatively also cut the fork relationship, which would make the Jenkins CI uh, repository, as well as every uh, repository that forked from Jenkins CI its own I think the term on GitHub is network. And uh, so this is my proposal of how that would work. And I've also prepared a script that you can see a few paragraphs down, a link to the Jenkins CI documentation. Um, 
where there is a list of all of the forks in the Jenkins CI organization. And my proposal is to reach out to the folks that have repositories forked into Jenkins CI and ask them to contact GitHub support to get the relationship inverted. Um, and uh, for those that don't react or refuse, we would end up cutting the fork relationship. Um, additionally, I will uh, spend some time to identify upstream repositories that are that actually have things like issues and pull requests. So where there would be some sort of loss of data involved if we did that. Um, I expect that that is the actually the minority, a tiny minority of repositories, but I don't have that data yet. So in this meeting, I seek approval to go ahead with the plan. Uh, all of the feedback that I received on the developers list was universally positive. Um, and Arnaud um, even brought up how uh, he experienced problems because of this fork relationship, because it's confusing and automated tools do not handle it really well. Uh, isn't build for plugin duplicated? Anyway, but yeah. Anyway, it's off topic. Yeah, it's deprecated. Uh, yeah. Uh, one question I had. Uh, so we are talking about all the repositories, not specifically plugin repositories, right? Um, mostly plugin repositories. There are a few others like plugin pom, where there is a fork relationship. That also doesn't make sense, but we do have some repositories that are actual forks. Like I think the repository called Xtreme Fork is deliberately a fork, um, or at least it was a while back. Um, and so, yeah, it's basically every repository that is a fork because that's how the hosting process works and not a fork because it makes sense um, uh, structurally. And it involves 30% of our repositories, right? So it's 810-ish. It's a big number. Yeah, yeah I, I expect to write a script to just look for upstream repos that perhaps have diverged history and uh, I have some plans to clean that up. Um, and I will just skip any repository where there would be problems that would result in something akin to data loss. Yeah, so it would be great. Uh, my question is, do we have enough information to vote? I guess on this call, everybody has already voted except Alex and yeah, I'm not sure Siamak, uh, whether you want to participate in this uh, vote. But yeah, if you want, you are totally welcome to do that. It's up on a meeting. Um, sure, I don't want to impose at all. So I'm uh, mostly listener, but if I get a vote, I, I obviously would use that. <laughs> yeah, you get a vote. Everybody gets a vote. Um, yes, so. Alex, Mark, what do you think? Yeah, I'm a plus one. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would like to investigate if we can change the hosting process so that we don't have to do this in the future. We've had discussions in the past of trying to do transfers of repositories instead of work. Um, so I think it'd be good if we reviewed that so we don't have to continue to do this in the future. So that's, that's one option. Another option would be um, to not actually use the GitHub feature that creates a fork, but create a new repo and just mirror all the commits and branches into that. Uh, this is, for example, what the Jenkins security team does for the private repositories that we have. Uh, we just create a new repo and mirror everything from the public repo, and then we work on security fixes. Um, that should the result should be the same, uh, except in the case where it's an existing um, popular plugin. If it's a plugin that already has forks and stuff, then we will have two independent networks, which will be sort of weird. 
but um, this looks, I think we can get most of the way there by just creating a new repo and mirroring all of the branches into it um, and manually doing the repo transfer perhaps. I'm not sure how easy that is to automate. Um, right. For the mi minority of cases uh, where we uh, want to retain stuff like existing issue trackers and pull requests. Uh, well, uh, it doesn't have to be manual because GitHub uh, supports uh, transfer requests now. It's not that yeah, tricky but... from user interface, but from API you can initiate the request transfer even if you're not a member of a GitHub organization now. Oh, really? Yeah. The... Well, I mean, I we could initiate the we could initiate the transfer, I guess, via the bot in our current hosting process, um, and then they would just have to approve it. Yeah. Is that um, what you're, a quick question: the repository transfers. Can we request uh, an inbound transfer, or can we only, or do does the uh, person requesting the hosting, do they have to request a transfer from them into Jenkins CI? From, my, from what I remember, the latter one. Uh, but yeah, GitHub changes quite quickly, so it might be the second option is already available. Sorry, the first one. But yeah, we want the first that. one, I think. The second one looks uh, the second one seems to be a bit cumbersome, so uh, I'm not sure how pra practical that will be in practice, but we can we can keep that in mind. Okay. I'll go take a look at the APIs and see what's available now. Mm -hmm. So for what it's worth, so I, I mentioned this in the thread on the dev list. I see these topics actually as, as almost independent because we never wanted the fork relationships to begin with. And for the last year or two, we actually um, told people or asked people in hosting requests to please uh, delete their repositories, um, which would end up hopefully making the repository in the Jenkins CI organization the canonical repository um, from which they can fork again. So. Um, in that sense, we never, for a long time, we didn't actually want this relationship and we've recognized that it's a problem. Um, it's just that the tooling hasn't caught up and I don't see a reason why um, one would necessarily block the other here. So I can go ahead with the folk relationship cleanup of existing repositories, even while the hosting process still works as it does. And in the other direction, we can fix the hosting process to not create forks uh, in the first place, uh, even while I'm not yet ready to clean up the fork relationships. Yeah, mm, I agree with that. And yeah, mm, we can uh, review it separately. I created an action item for you, Alex. So, Samak, what's your opinion? Uh, I'm also plus one for it. Uh, on one side, uh, from an ownership perspective, I think uh, all the communities I'm um, involved in follow the same, that the ownership of all, all those repos need to be with the, uh, with the main project, Jenkins in this case, uh, and having Jenkins fork uh, another repo or vendor repo, I think that uh, kind of goes uh, the opposite direction. And the second one is uh, to an like uh, outside looker, uh, especially for smaller projects, uh, uh, the direction of contribution becomes misleading when the repo is somewhere else and is forked into uh, Jenkins CI, that where they should get involved in where things happen first and then propagate to the forks. Um, for anyone that is deeply involved in the project, that won't be misleading. They would they would know exactly how this works. But uh, if you if you're not you're not deeply familiar with that, uh, just getting involved, it's not that obvious that all of the work happens on their Jenkins CI repos and then cherry, they get cherry picked by the repo that was actually originally forked. Right. Uh, so definitely for it. Okay. So. 
I guess we're in agreement to move it for, forward. Okay, anything else uh, on this topic? Okay. Moving on, Jira upgrade uh, plan in progress, Mark. So the plan has been discussed with Linux Foundation. I have a number of action items. Um, I've got to get on those action items. Uh, they're related to getting a backup, getting SSL access, etc. The This plan is accessible publicly. So if you've got comments on it, you are welcome to make those comments. Uh, but the hard stop deadline is November 28th, and we'll continue working on it. Just to make sure we continue this migration uh, without changing identity management, right? That is correct. That was a that was a, a mandatory, and the Linux Foundation team confirmed they can do that. So we do not have to change identity management. It doesn't block us from choosing to change identity management sometime in the future, but for this transition, it will not require a change of identity management. Okay, great. One less service to maintain. What could be better? Anything else on this topic or except the action item for everyone who is interested to take a look at the plan? Oh, Daniel, Adek, Sula. You need to read the plan first. Oh, okay. But yeah, we don't uh, vote on anything specifically right now. So yeah, it's just status update. Right. Okay, then if no other comments, moving on. Okay, 2020 board and officer election. So I started the discussion uh, yesterday in the mailing list. So uh, this discussion basically is submitted in advance because assuming that we follow one year election interval for officers, we are expected to hold an election in November. Uh, so that the uh, results are effective uh, in early December. Uh, but still, uh, there are some topics to discuss because, well, firstly, the elections is a bit complicated. And secondly, the 2019 election uh, was quite complicated from the implementation standpoint. So there are some discussions how it was done. There is also public retrospective we had for the previous election. Um, yeah, basically, this is what we created in December, I guess, we did some discussion and agreed on some items, but we haven't implemented them because well, the election was one year ago. So probably time to actually revisit that. Uh, so yeah, I split the feedback to three groups, uh, voting registration process. Uh, this last year it was quite difficult because we needed to send emails to 100,000 accounts, uh, also to get their consent. There were a lot of concerns about eligibility, etc. Um, then uh, generally, uh, in eligibility, we have issues from two sides. Firstly, we had no way to verify various uh, technical accounts and generic accounts. Uh, yeah, we know that uh, there are accounts owned by teams. We know that there are test accounts, like 15 accounts of Olivier and something like that, uh, to provide an example. Um, at the same time, um, we had a question actually with whether our voting is inclusive enough because we were relying on uh, uh, Jenkins LDAP uh, database. But um, currently, you don't have to be in the database to contribute. You can just use GitHub, GitHub issues, GitHub pull requests. You can uh, write uh, um, blog posts, whatever, uh, answer Stack Overflow, mailing list, etc. And uh, you won't be eligible uh, unless you create a LDAP account for the election. So these are uh, your main concerns and also uh, basically a lot of uh, manual stuff. So to address that, I started pulling together a process proposal. Basically, the idea is to change from uh, um, email notifications uh, to all registered users to public sign up with post factum eligibility verification. So what it means, we send um, uh, emails uh, basically to mailing lists, uh, also post in social media, etc., and anyone uh, can sign up. Then um, we do verification. 
uh, based on uh, providing data. So we will ask users to provide uh, GitHub accounts, uh, Jira, well, DAP accounts. And if uh, none of it works, uh, reference uh, to a public uh, proof of contribution. And if one of these uh, ways is confirmed, then um, a voter is considered to be eligible. Obviously, then uh, two, uh, two major pain points is firstly how we automate verification, assuming that there will be hundreds of voters like last year, um, and uh, how we do manual checks. Because uh, last year we avoided manual checks uh, just by providing um, an escape hatch. If you're not in, uh, if you didn't get notification, please send us a message. Nobody really did. But uh, this year it will be more likely with public announcement and public sign up that uh, there will be more users uh, submitting requests and putting public links to something like LinkedIn profiles. Who knows? Um, so, but still, I think that it would be one of the ways to go. And uh, I seek feedback from contributors. Again, no plan to vote on anything today. Uh, this is just up for discussion, and you can see that there is already a bunch of comments flowing in. Uh, but yeah, if somebody has experience with public uh, voting systems and sign up, uh, if uh, there are some tweaks how we could uh, automate eligibility check, uh, please feel free to comment. Mm. But, yeah. Oleg, I had one uh, question. Uh, when would you propose starting the Google form to collect um, those who would like to vote in the election? So, assuming we hold the vote in November, we should start to sign up in October. It doesn't have to be October 1st, but uh, definitely it should be at least that few weeks to sign up. Do you think that's long enough? Uh, yeah, this is something we can define. So, again, I just uh, started the document to kick off the discussion. Uh, if we take uh, 2019 process, so I'm just going back to 2019 election implementation. Well, it's partially in the mailing list, uh, partially on uh, the website. Uh, but yeah, here was a timing proposed by Tracia. Yeah, retrospectively, we know that this timing didn't work because we had issues again with sign up phase. We send all these accounts with uh, configuring some grid properly with collecting this data. Uh, but here, so we had the mination phase. And yeah, here we don't really have uh, voting sign up at all because it was a kind of uh, basically prompt implementation uh, during uh, um, the voting. So I'm just trying to find it. But actually, sign up was uh, just uh, implemented. Uh, uh, right on the flight, and uh, I'm not sure how much time did we get get to work or something like two weeks, I guess. At that point, I'm just I'm just worried that um, with the amount of verifications we may need to do, if we can't at least do those verifications, we um, mm -hmm. should be able to get, which we don't really. So I would say we give ourselves more time. Uh, Beforehand, before the vote, I can close the sign up in certain number of weeks before, and then time to do the verification. And uh, we're going to need verification issues before the actual voting. Okay. So basically, Alex, what you say that two weeks might not be enough for sign up uh, and for verification as well, right? Uh, we can uh, just um, set some ballparks. For example, if we say that the sign up time of four weeks, well, four weeks might be a bit different, though it's possible. Uh, and yeah, also voting time. So, for example, if we say four weeks here, then let's say two weeks here, and two weeks verification. Um, it means that uh, we would need to start uh, on October 1st uh, to hit uh, the timeline. Why do, you want to, why do you want to serialize sign-up and verification? Mm, yeah, we can uh, somewhat parallelize it.
it'll be beneath the uh, several I think days. I Verification, so we need to do the same thing. Yeah. Okay, so one week or so, right? Do I capture it right? Alex? Sorry, I'm trying to stay in as much as possible since I'm in this video. What was the question, sir? So, yeah, I basically reduced the verification time to one week to address Daniel's comment. Is it uh, what you were talking about? Because I didn't quite get it. Oh, the audio breaks. Okay. So what I suggest to do, uh, let So what I suggest to do is that we keep discussing it in the Google Doc. And what we finally need to do, we need to merge this uh, kind of uh, proposal, which is a div. Uh, we need to merge it uh, with our actual process description, uh, one we modified last time, so that we have a formal step-by-step -step process. This is also one of the retrospective feedbacks because, uh, yeah, uh, from a uh, 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 site participant who wasn't involved, uh, the process wasn't fully transparent last time. Uh, we got this feedback from multiple contributors. So if we just have step-by-step -step guide with all these phases listed and uh, with the assumption that we can deliver on this uh, time frame, I think it would be the end goal. So for now, I propose to keep discussing this Google Doc, and then uh, uh, somebody will need uh, to move it uh, into a single uh, board selection process documentation. Now, for that, uh, there is obvious reason that, yeah, what I make it to developer mailing list, I will be basically off until September, September, sorry, September 17th or so. Um, so, if uh, we start working on uh, that uh, at this time, would we fit? Uh, would we hit the timeline, or should we continue working on that uh, in the next weeks? Yeah, which balls? Is it Alex? Oh, yeah. So Alex, I think. Can I read comments? Uh, but yeah, I think let's just uh, continue the developer mining list because my gut feeling to that we actually need to facilitate it now if you want uh, to feasibly meet uh, the deadline of uh, December announcements, if you want to change the process. If we just uh, use the same grid process like before, if we have a bit more freedom, um, but yeah. Again, I'm not 100% sure about that. So yeah, keep talking. Let's uncover the next uh, governance board meeting, right? Okay, sorry uh, yeah, that it took a while, but yeah, any feedback will be appreciated. Anything else on elections or should we move on? Because yeah, with Alex in the car, uh, I'm not sure we can discuss it uh, efficiently right now. Okay, incoming community events and programs. So just quick update, uh, what to keep in mind. 
So Google season of dogs, um, basically we've accepted uh, one mentor. Um, so we'll have a project uh, focusing on uh, Jenkins uh, on Kubernetes documentation. And uh, this uh, scope includes, uh, well, basically everything uh, with regards to Jenkins uh, and Kubernetes, including uh, um, uh, plugins like Kubernetes plugin, including Helm charts, including uh, Jenkins Kubernetes operator and uh, other bits. Again, uh, this scope is a bit abstract right now because one of the parts is actually define a final plan and uh, mentors will be working on that together with Mentia. But if you're interested, uh, please join uh, the Google Season of Docs uh, channels because yeah, the project uh, topic is set. And I guess uh, yeah, Jenkins on Kubernetes is quite important uh, from the community value standpoint. So hopefully we will be able uh, to use this opportunity well because what we get is just an experienced technical writer uh, contributing to the project uh, for four months, including planning. And yeah, let's try to get best of that. And yeah, thanks uh, to mentors and uh, to all candidates who applied. Because yeah, this uh, year we had, uh, I guess, 10 plus candidates applying. Uh, many of them have contributed a lot to the Jenkins project. And unfortunately, we weren't able to accept everyone because as a first year organization, we are limited to one slot. Uh, but yeah, that's why I have a community bridge for docs in the bottom. Actually, I can just move it up. So I wanted to organize it, but yeah, I'm not sure whether I have any feasible bandwidth to drive this topic because it actually boils down to two questions. Firstly, budgeting, and secondly, mentors. Because we have no problems with mentors, uh, thanks to Google Season of Dogs, uh, there is a lot of candidates, and actually I wouldn't even uh, look for more candidates at the moment. Uh, but uh, yeah, the problem that uh, we need the mentoring teams uh, for the projects, at least to mentor the project, and also we easily need a kind of stipend. And right now, yeah, as we know, we are quite low on the budgets. Uh, we have started funding proof of concept, but we haven't started pushing it to fundraise money. So unless we find a corporate sponsor right now, yeah, budgeting is also a problem. But well, budgeting is something we can solve. Mentors is uh, more challenging. So if anyone has any ideas or if there are any particular interests, including company interests, to get some areas documented, uh, please contact us because yeah, this is how we get the projects running. Budgets, yeah, uh, we can shake some trees. Okay. So, yeah, but yeah, main concern about that, that even if you run it, it will be next year. I don't think that we can feasibly start the project uh, in the next months, taking all other um, requirements. Okay, October 1st. This is something we cannot uh, start uh, next year because it starts in October, whether we want it or not. Uh, so again, we need a kind of steering committee. We've been participating in October 1st for a few years before, and it was quite efficient. So last year we had uh, um, 127 unique contributors. Among them, uh, around 60 were first timers in the Jenkins organization, and uh, on average, uh, first timers contributed uh, three pull requests of different quality. But yeah, it was mostly about uh, documentation updates and some additional features, including pretty big Jenkins core features. So I would say that uh, overall it was quite a uh, good uh, experience for the organization and we should keep doing that. At the same time, uh, the question is about format. Because last year we tried to organize uh, local meetups as a part of Hacktoberfest. Hacktoberfest organizes local meetups as well. Obviously this year it's no-go option. So we either need to do something virtual, like we did in previous year, we had a, um, a kickoff sessions, like this uh, local events, yeah. So we had a grand opening session uh, where we had presentations about how to contribute. We also had Hacktoberfest results. So this, I guess, is kind of minimum format, but uh, yeah, we could probably at, uh, 
uh, more meetings, online meetups, and contrib uh, contributor meetups in the middle. For example, similar uh, to how we did your UX hard fest in May. So here we had how many meetups? Ten or so. Yeah, this is uh, what we published here, and actually we had more ad hoc ones. So it really depends on how many benvite uh, we have and how many maintainers uh, join the initiative, uh, because uh, yeah, these total events depend on featured projects. So this is the list we had uh, in uh, 2019. So there are still some topics we could move on. So for example, uh, Jenkins. Uh, warnings and J plugin. I guess Uli would be interested to document something. I'm not sure what was the experience for you, Uli, last year. Did you get contributions? Um, not really. <laughs> uh, it, it, just some newbie contributions, uh, but I think it was only five or so. And okay. these were mostly my students, so. Right. Maybe this is not the best topic. Yeah, for configuration as code, we definitely uh, got contributions. We got contributions for Jenkins for or Jenkins file runner. Also, we had topics like plugin documentation migration, which attracted a lot of interest. I guess this year we can keep that. We can also add terminology cleanup because we have for this project documented uh, on uh, uh, the documentation seek page, and we could probably just uh, scrub these topics and find the initial set, uh, but. Yeah, I guess we will also need to promote it among our maintainers uh, so that uh, we have uh, more topics on the table. The, uh, the docs office hours has been adding, systematically going through and doing triage. Mm -hmm. Jonathan Marais and Vlad Silverman have both been working those kind of topics. So I think, I think we've got good potential for at least docs side many opportunities that are well vetted by the time we reach October 1. Okay. So online meetups, featured uh, projects, and yeah, also we need organizers. So does anyone uh, want to be in the Hacktoberfest working group this year? Mm. Yes, yes. I would. Okay. And yeah, I think we can send a message to the mailing list so we could get some uh, usual suspects joining. So well, hopefully I, we will get some bandwidth. Right. I think that, for instance, Vlad and, and Jonathan may be interested in being part of the organizing. So I will bring it up to the office hours with the doc stick as well. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I think that I will send a message to the developer mailing list to start coordinating that. Mm, yeah. Well, Oleg, do you want me to take that given how loaded you are? I can, you can certainly delegate it to me and a big chunk of the will be docs. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I will uh, still do my best to help, but yeah, taking my availability in general, and okay, thanks a lot. Okay, um, so, um, yeah, moving on, DevOps Vault, yeah, quick update. Uh, Alice is looking for volunteers because, um, again, we will be doing a kind of the Jenkins stand at DevOps Vault. At this time, DevOps Vault is virtual. So you don't have to go anywhere. At the same time, yeah, we still need to mend the booths, et cetera. And yeah, all contributors are welcome. And pretty much the same for CDCon. So for CDCon, the format is yet to be decided. So DevOps World is September 22nd, 24th, if I recall correctly. This is October 8th, 9th. But yeah, for CDCon, Jacqueline, uh, Salinas, uh, and CDF, they are looking uh, for Jenkins representatives. Um, yeah, if you're interested, please join advocacy and outreach seek meetings. Um, yeah, 
So I guess it summarizes all community events we have. Uh, I'm not sure whether it really makes sense to even touch a uh, roadmap preview because yeah, we had quite a number of topics today. So maybe we could keep kick it down the road, uh, especially since the roadmap is pretty much up to date. We reviewed it in the middle uh, of July. Is it fine with everyone? Okay, so I will add it here. Okay. So, Samak, uh, would you be interested to talk about uh, Kubernetes related governance? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, is it a one hour to call? So, like, I have 10 minutes? Uh, we can uh, go slightly over time, but yeah, people might st uh, start dropping. Uh, but yeah, uh, sure. I think we can... uh, I'll adjust to the like time I have uh, a little detail. So the background is uh, that uh, we, as uh, Red Hat, we have a number of engineers, a team that works on uh, the, the the Kubernetes operator for Jenkins. Like Red Hat is an advocate for operators on Kubernetes in general, and uh, since we have a lot of customers that run Jenkins on OpenShift. Uh, we uh, we want them to use the, the Kubernetes operator instead of just deploying the images. Say they get much better experience with configuration of Jenkins and backup and all those capabilities. So we got involved in it uh, about a year ago, and uh, the initial work was done uh, by Virtuous Lab. They had done a great job as at bootstrapping this as a part of a consulting effort that I think they had done. Uh, with that reverse project setup that was discussed, that uh, the, the repo is active at Virtuous Lab is forked on, on Jenkins. Um, we have tried over the last year to like to collaborate, or we have been collaborating with Virtuous Lab. I think the, the problem we have recently had throughout the, uh, the time is that uh, there is a, a non-existing path to to a committer status on the on the project. So Virtuous Lab is a sole uh, committer on the project, which uh, makes it difficult when a single vendor is the sole committer on, on it. So it becomes a unnecessary level political based on the uses that Virtuous Lab has uh, of the operator at their customers. Um, uh, which is understandable, but like, it, but it's not healthy for um, for 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 the operator itself. So the way we, we have we are in a similar situation as Red Hat in many of the projects that we, we are involved in open source project. We are invested in the success of the project, and then we drive within that community things that our customers um, uh, care about. Uh, but also we are relying on the other members of the community, other vendors to vet these requests, right? To make sure that these are sane, these are good. And, uh, and that, that's how a healthy health community would work. When it's a single vendor, then it becomes a, a place for the interest of a single vendor as well. So a lot of the PRs, uh, there, are numer there are like more than 10 PRs, I think that they've got rejected so far and the rest of them takes months to um, to get to get merged uh, because of the, the pushbacks of not being in line with what Virtual Lab customers uh, want, um, and we have been living this this reality for about a year. What recently has happened is that Virtual Lab does not have the they, they don't want to spend much time on the operator anymore. They don't have the resources. The main committer had unfortunately some health issues. And while that person was gone, we were completely in the black because no one else can commit anything like uh, till he came back. He's feeling better coming back, but the recent communications that we have had, and I'll ask uh, my team to send the email again with the longer background to the to the public uh, mailing list, so you have more, more more background on it. Is that they are they have uh, they're changing their priorities has changed. Uh, uh, and uh, they would not be spending much effort on the operator, uh, which is fine. This is obviously <laughs> every, every company has uh, different priorities. So this is uh, nothing unusual there. What is unusual is that they, they want to keep uh, the sole ownership of that project, which that, that's the issue real, that, uh, that you, they, they, don't, they don't have the resources and bandwidth to be active on the project anymore. And they don't want anyone else to have committer rights, which means the project essentially gonna die in this um, in its form. 
and they have uh, they want to work on the project on their internal repo, which is right now the main repo. So essentially taking the project back into uh, a, a vendor project, um, which is a step back in our opinion uh, uh, for it. We get a lot of good feedback about the operator, uh, both on Kubernetes and OpenShift. So we are invested in, we're hoping that more vendors get involved, more individuals get involved, and this becomes a thriving component uh, of the Jenkins community. Uh, but the current situation seems that this is not going, uh, unfortunately, in that in that direction. And, and uh, we have tried to converse with Virtuous Lab for uh, a number of times to address this because uh, we you, like the community is formed through the members of the community. It does it shouldn't need to be like intervention from outside to to fix that? Uh, but unfortunately, that didn't give any results either. So this has been our last resort to reach out to Oleg and and raise this our concern in the situation to to the board, see if there are any paths to uh, to get more more people involved. Uh, we we don't want to Red Hat end up in that situation either. So. We, a Kubernetes operator in, in that situation, I mean, to be the sole owner of this repo, right? We, we want the Kubernetes operator to, to have, a, through the community, guarantee the survival of the operator, regardless of if there is a Red Hat tomorrow or Virtual Slack tomorrow or not. So that, that's really what we want from that community. Um, so the ask is basically, we have had a couple of chats with Oleg as well. The ask is to see how we can, uh, what are the paths to turn the Kubernetes operator for Jenkins uh, into a, a more like a, a multi-interest or multiple sides and vendors and individuals be part of the, um, um, uh, like not to call the board, but rather like the technical uh, the oversight committee, or uh, since since Jenkins community has multiple layers, I, I, I'm like that's why I'm hesitating not to introduce a term that uh, is in conflict with the hierarchy of the, but something like that that has oversight over uh, this operator, the community going forward, that it goes in the right direction, and uh, neither us as Red Hat or Norwich staff or any other one can uh, like push it back in the in the in the like. Uh, wrong direction essentially mm -hmm. yeah uh, so just uh, to clarify and to provide some more insights yeah uh, i've been in contact with actually both parties over past weeks though i, I didn't get uh, much response on my uh, from my virtual lab so far but yeah, I was separating basically as individual. Uh, I think that uh, one of the ways which is quite clear, um, and uh, this is actually why we have a Jenkins governance board, is to reach out to parties as Jenkins governance boards and to see uh, how we can mitigate that and whether we could find the way. Because for example, for me, one of these proposals was to have a kind of working group, et cetera, with uh, three parties, uh, so that uh, none of the parties actually is dominant. Uh, one of the ways is to have, let's say, one representative from uh, Virtuslav, one representative from Red Hat, uh, and another representative from the governance board, or something like that. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, one of the ways, uh, and Personally, I believe that it would be the best way to proceed, actually to create a working group, etc. may eventually onboard more parties. And yeah, there is a kind of incoming proposal with details for that. Uh, the second way we discussed is actually having a second uh, repository. Uh, one or why it's important because yeah assuming that virtual lab keeps uh, evolving the existing project and there is significant deviation and for example there is roadmap proposal for may 21st um, it was uh, submitted based on the discussions at the community meetings so jenkins uh, his kubernetes operator has uh, weekly meetings uh, which are referenced from jenkins calendar so basically this roadmap was discussed at these meetings and yeah, current state that there is roadmap proposal basically getting 
no reviews, etc., which is a concern on its own, I would say. Uh, so for me, one of the ways would be to actually have uh, internal fork. So when uh, we have current operator, which evolves basically how it evolves, and we create another fork, which becomes a new upstream, basically for this uh, roadmap or whatever, uh, user attempt to create open governance, uh, or maybe, and uh, which evolves separately. Yeah. So yeah, it might pose issues with stars, etc. So it's likely to be a hard fork uh, with some um, a period of uh, chaos uh, when users still have to understand what is the operator is what and uh, the community will need to adjust. But uh, this is the second way I proposed. Uh, the problem uh, is that we actually have no clear way, let's say, uh, Jenkins governance. Uh, maintainers of components uh, retain sole power. Uh, in Jenkins core, etc., we have a uh, mitigation process, uh, but uh, for components, basically the maintainers have full decision. And yeah, I checked all the documentation. Unless you apply code of conduct, uh, there is no actual way to do permission transfer um, uh, when uh, a maintainer actively disagrees with it. Uh, well, for better or of worse, this is just the current situation. Uh, so basically for me, it's open governance easily and I propose to negotiate uh, with uh, Richter Schlapp and uh, with other parties as first step. Um, probably uh, somebody else from uh, governance board uh, could be driving this discussion because at the moment I'm uh, rather involved and um, one may question my neutrality because yeah, I'm really interested about uh, in the future of this project. Um, and uh, yeah, second way is to actually start preparing to hard fork uh, with uh, option to actually replace the existing fork if it's inactive. Okay. Well, like I, <clears throat> I, I'm more than happy to join the conversation if, mm -hmm. if you need someone else for the Mm -hmm. So regarding time zones, may, uh, maybe uh, Uli has a better overlap, uh, but yeah, Alex, if you have been right, it's so awesome. Yeah, Kubernetes is nothing that I'm touched with. I, I don't know much about Kubernetes, and maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Just in the sense of uh, being a completely unbiased third party hopefully mm -hmm. okay so i guess our next step would be actually to start a formal discussion in the mailing list with all the context um and um, okay, alex if you can uh, be leading uh, discussion yeah, I may um, contact you just to get a little bit of background before I send that email out, but you can definitely send that extra to me. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess uh, Siamak and the Red Hat team have an action item to send a summary of the conversation, and I will also share my insights uh, privately. Yeah, sure. Would you let me know where, where I should send? Is that is that to uh, Jenkins Dev or... What what would be a public uh, forum that we can we can see? So into? yeah, basically we have uh, two main channels for that. So there is uh, Jenkins Governance Board, which is a private channel, and there is also uh, uh, Developer Mailing List, which is a public uh, okay. venue. Okay. So how our governance works? Uh, basically, all the discussions and decision making happen in the public channel. Uh, Jenkins governance board is rather for escalations. So, for example, for code of conduct, etc. Then it's uh, governance board. But for public decision making, it's a developer mailing list. So, okay. depending on the way you choose, you can uh, take the mailing list. But yeah, I think that since we are discussing them publicly on the record, and this we can uh, start from the public discussion right away, unless somebody is against. I think that seems fine. Okay. 
Okay. One, two, cinco. Uh, I will send uh, my insights uh, to the board mailing list, not because uh, there is uh, something private, um, but yeah, I will sh share what I have to say public publicly and share some additional insights. Okay. So, my, for now, yeah, this discussion may uh, take some time. Um, do you seek any immediate steps? Uh, are you fine with us kicking off the discussion? And yeah, I, I think that's those. fine. Yeah. yeah, from my perspective, that that's fine because I, I, I like this. This needs to. I think this needs to also set an example of going through the right process, right? So, like rushing mm -hmm. that would, would would kind of be contrary to that purpose as well. Um, so. Uh, I'm fine with the next, next step. I'd be fine to just discuss that on a uh, public forum. So we can uh, have status sync up at the next governance meeting. Yeah, uh, ideally, if we could uh, get other people uh, on the call, uh, including Virtus Lab, it would be ideal. Uh, but yeah, it's a kind of best effort, but let's try to do it. Sure. Um, and yeah, let's see how much feedback we will get because yeah, once it's sent to the developer mailing list, uh, Jenkins Kubernetes Operator is actually quite popular. Uh, so we got a lot of adoption, so maybe we could have uh, more stakeholders. And the discussion. Okay. Any additional comments and questions on this topic? So, Oleg, is this a place where, or maybe I should just bring it up with Shamak separately, that the Kubernetes operator might be a great thing to have a, a synchronization session in the cloud native SIG context to help uh, Zenob and others know how to document it in the Jenkins on Kubernetes pro pro project. Yeah, it was the original plan. We oh, it was. We okay. had a discussion about Kubernetes operator in uh, June. Okay. After Thomas did a presentation, uh, well, no, it was May. After Thomas did a presentation at the Jenkins Online Meetup, we had a kind of uh, discussion. And we agreed uh, that uh, with restarting of uh, Jenkins Cloud Native Seek, uh, Kubernetes operator will be one of the funding projects, funding projects version 2.0, uh, but yeah, we didn't move uh, much further because uh, it was summer break. So I tried to organize meetings uh, a few times. So for example, we still have, we tried to organize a meeting about uh, Jenkins and Tikton, etc. But uh, yeah, it was relatively silent. I still, uh, I think that uh, in principle, uh, we agree on that. And yeah, we agreed on the scope, what would be the projects, etc. So, yeah, basically we agreed on the scope with a few amendments. Uh, but yes, so once we are ready, let's do that. And we had a discussion about uh, Helm charts already, because Helm charts in the, are in the list as well. And since they are being moved uh, to the Jenkins organization officially now, yeah, I guess it will be one of the first meetings. And uh, according to the developer mailing list, Mark will be hosting that. Um, so, um, yeah, I believe that Cloud Native Seek uh, should actually be revived. Um, yeah. So after I return back, I will definitely be spending more time than I was able to dedicate. Uh, but yeah, uh, whatever crowd activities, so we have 10 people who can host meetings, etc. So. Uh, as a current uh, SIG leader, uh, basically a blanket approval to anyone who wants to host a meeting uh, for any topic related to Cloud Native C, please do that. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I'm actually looking for the Helm chart thread. Somewhere here, right? Uh, 
I don't remember if it was there or in the doc sig, but that's okay. We can add it separately. No, it's actually. Oh, there it is. The yes, there it is. You're right. That is it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So yeah, mm, let's just keep pushing that. And yeah, assuming that uh, we start surviving governance, etc., cloud native seek could be additional venue to facilitate feedback. Because what we discussed with Tomash before, there is a lot of cross dependencies between uh, Jenkins and operator, for example, how to efficiently use JCASC, how to efficiently use new features, maybe how to integrate Jenkins file runner into the scope. So there is a lot of opportunities we could discuss. Uh, and yeah, let's just try to do that. More contributors we have, um, it's a good, good opportunity for us. Okay, so we are going over time even more than expected. Uh, so any other topics to discuss before we close the meeting? Okay, uh, yeah, one topic is the next meeting. So it's September 9th. Uh, in principle, I should be available. In practice, I have no idea what will be my uh, network quality. So it would be great if uh, somebody else uh, hosts uh, this meeting. I was curious there, Oleg, isn't, isn't the two weeks after September 9 likely to collide with DevOps world? So should we, would we benefit by saying, we'll instead shift the next meeting out one more week and meet the, the 16th of September so that we avoid then avoid and avoid DevOps world, which is the following week. It would make sense in principle. So again, assuming that we uh, do time sensitive discussions in the developer mailing list and do not wait for the meeting, right. uh, then yeah, basically the meeting is just a status check for everything. Uh, so I am fine with moving to September 16th. And Uli, as the other board member present, are you okay with that? It's okay. It's a good idea. To clarify, this is only once and not a new schedule? Uh, good question. So if, if it's, well, I'm, I was assuming that September 16 and then two weeks after September 16. Yeah, that wouldn't work because, I mean, we would... Um, detach the meeting dates with the LTS from the LTS schedule. Ah, ah, that's a danger. Okay. So moving to September 16 is fine, but your point is it's better if we get back on cadence. So then my, my proposal may not make any sense. Okay. Then. So what we can do September 9th and then September 16th, then we oh. skip because September 9th is the release date. Does it okay. make sense? That makes sense, yes. And yeah, in the worst case, so yeah, basically again, governance meeting uh, doesn't necessarily have to be hosted by a governance board member. So only if you're not available, if Alex is not available, yeah, maybe Mark or Daniel could host it. Okay. Yes, yeah, September 9th is great then, thanks. And then September 16th and then uh, TBD. But yeah, I agree that it makes sense uh, to skip the week of DevOps world because okay. many participants have commitments there. It then make more sense to move the September 16th one week after the DevOps world? Sorry. I think that we can just uh, have a meeting after that. So it would be uh, October something. Uh, yeah, then uh, back to common schedule. Right. Great. Yeah. So keeps us on the cadence, so we aren't we aren't missing the LTS dates. Good. Thanks for that insight, Daniel. Okay. Again, uh, yeah, we can. Uh, it means that we will meet one extra time, but at the same time, we can just keep our meeting. Let's say thirty minutes, not like today. Let's see. Okay, does it work for everyone? Yeah. Okay, then let's assume that that's the plan.
And yeah, for roadmap review, I think we can target September 16th then. Uh, or nine, whatever works. Yeah, I, I would prefer 16. I don't okay. think that it's it's urgent that we do it and it's great if it's in, in your voice and yeah. Uh, okay. Thanks for reminding me that I still need to record my talk about it. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'll uh, move it to the next meeting. Okay, no other topics for today. Uh, Right. So thanks to everyone. Uh, thanks, Siamak, for joining. And uh, yeah, the, to whomever watches the recording, uh, please feel free to join the next meetings because, again, it's a public venue for everyone who is interested uh, in the Jenkins project. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah.